My name is Tracy Wilkinson. I'm the Director of Stakeholder Engagement at the MTP Connect WA Life Sciences Innovation Hub. Um, and we are here to accelerate the growth of that sector in WA. Before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're on today. Um, it's the Noongar, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And for those who might be joining us online, pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the lands where you are joining us from today. So before we go any further, I'm going to introduce Eric Haller and myself, and we're going to sit down because this is supposed to be casual, <laughs> fireside, fireside chat style. Um, so for those that don't know about the hub, it's Rebecca Craggs, who I'm going to point out down here, um, Professor Kevin Flager, who everybody in Perth knows, and myself. We're based here in the sixth floor of the Perkins, but have a mandate to really grow the medtech, biotech, digital health sector here in WA. Um, I would like to note that we are recording today's event. For those joining us online, welcome. Hopefully you're in your pyjamas, dry and warm. Um, big thanks to everyone who came out in the cold and the wet to join us today. I'm really excited and interested in this conversation because I've had a little bit of a sneak peek um, with a conversation I've already had with Eric. So questions are encouraged from the audience. For those online, type them into the chat function, please. And my colleague, Rebecca, will... Um, speak them out into the microphone so that everybody can hear. And for those here in the room, if you could just come up to the microphones again, so those online can, um, I think we can all acknowledge that hybrid events are not, not the best experience for either side, those in person or those online, but bear with us as we try and do our best. And if anyone has been to an awesome hybrid event and has got any suggestions, we reckon I would be more, more than happy to hear them. Thank you. So before we go any further, welcome Eric. Thank Eric you. is the president and the CEO of ARQ Solutions. So welcome to the spotlight. Welcome to Perth. I know you've had a bit of an adventure to get here, but um, that's just the normal COVID story, I think, anymore. So I'm going to ask yourself to introduce you and, um, and tell us how you ended up at ARQ and then also what attracted you to the company. Sure. So good morning. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and it has been a little bit of a, of a journey. To get here, but it's really, but it's been really fantastic. I mean, you know, we've had some great meetings in Melbourne and Sydney, and then Perth yesterday, and really just fantastic interacting with the Aussies and and understanding the business here and the market here. Um, so, as, as you mentioned, I am the president and CEO of a company called AIQ Solutions. We are a medical device startup company that has officially been around since 2015 but from a practical point of view has only been around since about 2019. And before that, it was really just being incubated at a university, the University of Wisconsin. And I'm sure we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, this is my second startup. I was introduced to the founders of AIQ from one of my board members and investors in my first startup. And I think it really just speaks to both the importance of networking and the importance of building those relationships. Um, before that, I worked for GE Healthcare. Um, which I'm sure everyone here has heard of GE Healthcare. I was a general manager of a global business. I was responsible for anesthesia delivery devices and ICU ventilators um, with the team spread around the world, um, covering the business around the world. And then before that, I worked for Baxter Healthcare. So some fairly large companies before deciding to become an entrepreneur. Okay, I'm gonna ask an unscripted question. What led to that transition from big med tech into startup? Um, it's, it was really about decision making and risk taking. And so when you work for a company like GE, you know, there is no, there's no decision, there's no actually even business when they, within their umbrella of businesses that is worth taking even a moderate level of risk because it's just such a big, big, big thing. And by nature, I am really just drawn to situations where you evaluate a situation, you look at the different options, and you jump, you take a risk. And the thing about startups is that, you know, if you don't take risks, you will fail. If you do take risks, you may fail. <laughs> but if you don't take risks, you will fail. And so to be in a place where we could try something, if it didn't work, you get together and the next day you say, that didn't work, let's try something else. What do we learn from it? And just keep trying and keep making, you know, taking those risks. That's, that's what gets me up in the morning. One of the things that gets me up in the morning. That's a fascinating insight. Thank you. So 
how do you explain ARQ solutions and what it's working to achieve? I know we've done that in the event right registration, so everyone knows all about ARQ, but how do you describe it to people when you meet them in the elevator or at a barbecue? Yeah. So, so I, you know, the first thing I always start with is I first say, are you a doctor or not? <laughs> because I, because my, my spiel is very different when I'm talking to, to physicians, regardless of, of where I encounter them. Okay, sorry. Um, but are there the, any doctors in the room? Are there any doctors in the room? Clinicians. <laughs> clinicians. Just clinicians. Just clinicians have a different, you know, typically have a different jargon, if you will. Um, but but at a, at a simple, relatively simple level, we are trying to improve outcomes for patients with complex diseases, starting with metastatic cancer, by optimizing therapy at a later point in the patient journey. So, you know, you, everyone's heard of this, this, this phrase, personalized medicine, right? And everyone's probably very familiar with where AI is being used to help with things like identifying people who might be at high risk of disease, helping with the diagnosis. And there's a lot of stuff in, in the personalized medicine space that's trying to match a potential patient with a potential therapy. What's interesting is that for patients that have complex diseases, again, like metastatic cancer, there's a lot of opportunity to improve that, that patient's outcomes, life, quality of life, by optimizing the therapy after they've been diagnosed, and after they've started on treatment. But there's not very much in the way of technology just to, to support that. And so that's our space, is that after diagnosis, you know, how do you take that patient that's probably not going to be cured of their disease at that point, but if you can keep that patient in a healthier, stabler state for longer, that's good for everybody. Excellent. Um, please ask questions whenever I jump in. I'll take your questions over mine any, any day of the week. Um, I always like to ask people their origin story. So where did ARQ come from? How did it, how did it get started? Um, it came from a couple of researchers at a university with a real problem, um, which is you know, probably a, a story that's very familiar to a lot of the people in this room. Uh, our founders were a medical, a medical physicist and a medical oncologist. And Dr. Liu, the medical oncologist, does clinical research, but also treats patients with prostate cancer. And he was very familiar with this, this gap between what he was expecting for the response of his patients to a given treatment and the actual outcomes that they were seeing. And so he teamed up with Dr. Urai, who's a medical physicist, and they started working on a technology to better understand how the cancer was responding to the therapy at a more granular level. You know, specifically when you have a lot of different metastases, how do each of those metastases uniquely respond to therapy? And how does that, that response then translate into the patient's overall response to that therapy? So probably about 15 years ago, they started doing this research and they, they do, did what academics do. They presented and they published. And that got the, the, the information out there. And a pharmaceutical company saw their presentation and said, you know, this is amazing. We want to use this in one of our clinical trials. And the university said, we don't sell software. If you want to sell software, you need to form a company, license the intellectual property from us, and then you can do that. So they formed this company in 2015 for the purpose of, of actually selling this software to this pharmaceutical company. And from 2015 to, to late 2018, they did continue to be professors and they continued to, to provide you know, what was really not a product, it was really a, re, a, a university research project. To this pharma company, it worked great. And then towards the end of 2018, they were at a crossroads and they decided that either this was gonna be a hobby or it was gonna be a business. And they decided to go with the latter. I got connected to them and came on as the CEO and became the first actual employee in January of 2019. We then went out and raised our seed financing. And I, I know you're probably gonna ask a few questions about that. Um, in August of 2019, at that point, we had one full-time employee that was me and we had three part-time employees. Um, now we are in 2022, we are up to 30 employees. We have a, you know, an entity in Australia. We also have an employee in Europe. We're spread all around the US. Um, so that's kind of been that, that growth projectile since we brought in that first financing. Yeah, it's a high growth. 
That's why we talk about those as high tech, high growth potential <laughs> yes. companies. So when the team as a collective not, reflects back on the startup process thus far and based on your learnings, are there any tips for those looking to create a startup out of a university project who might be here in the room? So, the, the, you know, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the first thing is if you're going to be in med tech in particular, and I can really only, I mean, so you probably heard in my background, my, my career has been in medical. So I, you know, don't ask me about IT or any of those other spaces. But if you're going to be in med tech, it all starts with the science. And so, you know, fundamentally, do you have solid science behind what you're doing? Um, and if you're, if you can't say definitively, and if other people wouldn't look at it and say definitively that, yes, you have something that is solid and unique in the science, then your probability of success is pretty low. Um, and then the second thing I would say is, it's, it is critical to find the right point in time to do that spin out. As soon as you get out there, you start bringing, bringing in other people's money, you pretty much start a clock. And, in, and the, that clock can be pretty relentless. Um, and so you want to make sure that you have incubated your idea within the university setting, you know, leveraging the resources that the university environment will give you so that you were at a point that when you finally do start that, that clock, you're going to be able to make that rapid progress. And a lot of people do try to come out too early. So either the science isn't ready or there's just no way that they're gonna to get to, you know, the word we use is the milestones, right? The investors wanna see you hit your milestones. You know, if you don't have the, the ability to project and say, yes, we're gonna be able to accomplish these things in a two year period of time, then maybe you need to spend a little bit longer, you know, continuing to kind of incubate before you're ready to, to, to jump out. Interesting perspective. Has anyone got any questions on that specifically? No? So I'll let you have a drink of okay. coffee if you like. Ahead, <laughs> so what is the startup scene like in, in Wisconsin? And is it supported by the university and, and by the government? It is. Um, and particularly the, you know, the early stage startup scene is very strong in, in, in Wisconsin and particularly in Madison. So for those who don't know, first of all, Wisconsin is a state that's kind of in the center of the country, but way up north. So we have very cold winters. Um, Madison is the capital of the state and it's also where the state university is. Uh, it's the second biggest city in the state. It's actually not a particularly big city. Um, we do though have the biggest medical physics department, at least in the US. So there's a real specialty around medical physics, which gets into what we do. And then we have a, an, an anchor company there, which is the biggest electronic medical record company in the US is based there. So there's a, a nice pool of talent in the IT, healthcare IT space. Um, but the biggest piece is that there's just a lot of innovation coming out of the university. University of Wisconsin has a very sophisticated technology transfer office. That's important. Um, in terms of helping startups, they, they not only manage the, the intellectual property side, which they do very well, um, but they also make investments. So they are one of our investors. And that's, that's important from a, a capital point of view. Um, and then, you know, there's enough of a thriving ecosystem that you have that sort of cross fertilization of ideas. So all of that is very much supported by the university, um, enabled by the university, if you will. Um, Wisconsin also set up a program with some very friendly tax credits for individuals who invest in venture companies like ours. And so that has really enabled companies to more easily get um, seed funding. So angel funding and seed funding, that initial funding you need when you first do that spin out. Um, and so from that point of view, the government has been very supportive. Um, Without getting political, unfortunately, there was a, a le some legislation to create a similar level of support for later stage investment that failed. And Wisconsin is now very much lagging all of the states around us in terms of funding for companies beyond seed stage. And what that means is companies like us essentially have to go out of state once you get to a certain size. Um, and so I, you know, I think there's an opportunity for the state governments if they really want to not just incubate ideas, but keep those ideas local and grow them locally, 
they need to be thinking about sort of that whole pathway until a company is going to get to profitability and continuing to, to provide that assistance for the companies all the way. That's very relevant insight. I think for WA, very similar story here. There's a big pressure on trying to keep and retain companies here. Um, a lot of our, we talk about government as being the funder or as support, I mean, grants and, and other sorts of non-dilutive funding, but it sounds like the support in Wisconsin is slightly different in those tax credits. So is that correct? Is there other grant opportunities, non-dilutive? There, there are, and it, you know, it is, everything's more complicated than the initial answer, of course. Um, the, one of the big things they've done that I think is particularly innovative were these tax credits. Um, and I promise you, every single investor that's local in Wisconsin wants their tax credits. It's, <laughs> it's a whole big process at the end of the year to fill out the paperwork. Um, the, another thing that the state did do is the state did set up a venture capital fund for startups. So they did put a little bit of money directly into direct investment. And one of the lead investors from our seed round is part of this. It's, it's called the Badger Fund of Funds because in Wisconsin, our state mascot is the Badger. Anyone, anyone know what a badger is? It's this little mean furry animal. <laughs> um, and so one of the, the funds that's in this group of funds that gets part of their money from the state, but, but, but it's a matching fund. So that they had to go raise direct investment from individuals and then the state matched it. Okay. So that is a source of some funding for us. Um, there are additionally grants. And so we've probably from state funding, we've probably brought in a couple hundred thousand US of, of state funded grants. Um, we've also accessed federally funded grants. Um, so all of those pieces do, do, I mean, they all add up. Yeah. It's nice to hear though, that there's state by state rivalry in the US too. Oh, there absolutely is. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, yeah, there absolutely is. And, and, and part of it is because if you track it, people will, will use it that way. And so there are organizations that track all these things. And, um, you know, you start to get to a point where it's like, well, you know, even Missouri is doing more than, than Wisconsin, <laughs> right? It's like, it's okay if, if Illinois is, but when Missouri is. Then it's too far. Right, then it's like, okay, now we got to do something. <laughs> Hopefully there's no one from Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not going to admit it now. <laughs> so what is the funding like for startups in, in, in Wisconsin? And do you think fundraising generally is a key challenge in, in WA? It's certainly the primary reason that people would reach out to me to, to want to have a chat. Um, so I'm sure that the audience will be really keen to hear of your experiences in this area in particular. Um, so again, the, the, the fundraising at that very early stage for us is a good environment. Um, you know, when you really are very, very uh, early getting started, you're, you know, a lot of people start off by looking for money from what's called an angel investor. And an angel just means a, an individual who wants to make a very high risk investment, um, has the money to do so. And so it is not uncommon for a company to do what's now called a pre-seed round. Um, which is just getting money from, from some of these angels or sometimes from a group of these angels. And you can find these angel groups pretty much anywhere. Um, because Wisconsin has so much innovation, there are several angel groups in Wisconsin that, that do like to invest in this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then, as I mentioned, there's this other infrastructure to help companies early on, really up to raising about maybe four or five million. That's, a, that's about as far as you can go with the um, financing that's available in Wisconsin. Um, it's hard work. I mean, it, you know, bottom line is wherever you're raising money, it, it is, it's a selling process. It's, you know, I, somebody once said you have to talk to 100 to get one. It's kind of the ratio. So you just do, you know, conversation after conversation after conversation. And when you're early stage, you know, you're not selling a business that has revenue and profit and all of those things. You're selling a vision. And so all you're really doing is you're looking for somebody that understands and buys into your vision. And so they'll, you know, they'll try to make it seem very scientific, how they're going to evaluate you. And they want all this data and you're, you know, you're really making most of it up at that point. Um, and everyone knows you're making it up. Um, but really, truly, you're just talking to so many people 
that eventually you stumble on the person who gets excited about what you're doing and, and thinks you've got a chance of success. And that's how you get that, that pre-seed and even the seed funding. It changes when you get to the next round, which is called Series A. And you know, again, for those who aren't very familiar with the entrepreneurial world, you start at Series A and the next one is B and the letters can just keep on going. I mean, sometimes you hear about these companies doing a Series E, Series F. And you wonder, don't they have to actually make money eventually? Um, but once you start to get to that Series A, so our Series A was $10 million US. Um, we were not gonna be able to raise all of that from within Wisconsin. Um, and not from within the VC market in, in Wisconsin. And once you get into the letters, now it is about proof that people want what you are developing and will pay for it. So, you know, can you find customers? Can you find, you know, opinion leaders who will talk about how special this is, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but again, it's a, you know, so when you're a CEO, you never stop fundraising. Even, you know, you, you, you close around, you look at the money in the bank, you have a party, and maybe you take a week off, and then you start calling people. Because it just, it's all about building those relationships. And, you know, they, all, they always say the worst time to meet an investor is when you need money. So it's, you know, it's, it's just something you just have to keep at. Have you ever tallied up how many of those pitches you've done? For my Series A, I, I used actually a, a software called Salesforce, which you might've heard of, it's a customer resource management system. Um, so every in conversation went in there, uh, 125 conversations. Okay. And how get. many of those were successful, if you don't mind so, estimating? Um, in the end, so successful is a weird, weird word. Sure. Right? <laughs> um, because out of the 125, there's, I'm gonna say 30 to 40 of those, where the conversation was, this is really interesting, but, but you're still too early for me. So, you know, let's keep in touch. The investors always love to say, let's keep in touch. Um, but so those I wouldn't necessarily call failures so much, but they weren't really successes. The, in terms of out of all those conversations, how many of those actually put money in, in the last round, three. Yeah. And it was a lead investor that had a co-lead. And then there was one more fund that um, elbowed their way in, um, to be honest with you. Because once you get the lead, what the lead also doesn't want you to have 30 people invested in the company. Um, it's, being, it's called your cap table, your capitalization table. So who all is invested in your company and how much of the company do, do they own? Um, once you find the company that says, yep, I'm gonna write you a check for $5 million, they don't want, you know, 10 more people because those 10 people become a distraction for the CEO. Um, and it just makes things more administratively complex. So once we had our lead, our lead brought a co-lead and I'm happy to, to define what those mean if you want. But, um, and then, like I said, there was- If you want thing. to know, just raise your hand. <laughs> and do I, does people want me to go more into a lead versus co-lead and how that works? Mm. Okay, yes, we got, we got yes. excellent. Um, so the, the lead investor, is the investor that actually defines the value of your company, as well as all of the other aspects of what you're selling. So there's something that's called a term sheet. And the term sheet is really just the, I'm gonna say roughly dozen different parameters that you negotiate when you sell part of your company. And so part of it is how much money they give you, um, how much of the company they get for that money, which comes down to, the, you know, we call that the valuation, how much your company is worth. But it's really how much are you selling and for what price? But it also includes things like what special rights do those investors have? Um, there's a whole litany of those. What does your, what your board look like? So, you know, once you bring in other people's money, they're going to want to keep an eye on it. Um, and they will want to help you, whether you want the help or not. Hopefully you bring in the right people. Um, and so all of that gets negotiated through the term sheet. Sometimes you will end up with an investor that says, I really like this. We think this is a good idea. We want to invest our money, but we don't feel we have enough expertise to, to completely make the decision ourselves. And so we want to bring in a partner that has expertise that fills in a gap of what we have. And so in our case, 
we had a what's called a strategic, which just means a company rather than a venture capital firm or you know um, that led the round, but they wanted a large life sciences based venture capital fund to co lead to kind of give them give it that double check to make sure that they were not making a mistake. So that became our co lead, um, and you know, so did that did, did that answer the question? Thank you. That was very well explained. Um, so obviously, you might have understood from Eric's accent, we talked about Wisconsin a lot, and that's where IQ started. So the next question, which is really kind of the hub of why we met in, in, in bio and, and I brought the minister to, um, to have a conversation with you, is why did you come to Perth to set up your, off, your next office? Um, so it actually goes back to, you know, it's all about the science. Mm -hmm. And, you know, start with the science. Um, there's some really fantastic science coming out of here, especially in the areas of nuclear medicine and medical physics, which again is, is the, the foundation of what we do. Um, and that's really, you know, bottom line, it all started with that. Because this was a place that, I wouldn't say we hit a wall with our scientific development in the US, but we were starting to see uh, diminishing returns on our partnerships. We have partnerships with a number of academic institutions in the US as well. Um, but there was a, a, a lot that we had to gain from a partnership here. Um, so that was the first piece. The second piece that's very important is the Australian government, both, both at a national level, level and at state level, is very inviting to foreign companies if they want to set up here. And there's some very nice incentives that made it very attractive for us. Um, in terms of why Perth UWA in particular, I mentioned Dr. Uri was one of our founders. He did his sabbatical here. Again, it goes back to the good science that comes out of here. He did his sabbatical here and he built relationships with some really brilliant researchers here. And, you know, he was actually the one who early on in my days was like, we need to go to Australia. <laughs> kind of like Australia. I like him. It's like really far away. And, you know, no, we need to go to Australia. And then, you know, Dr. Francis was in town. You have to meet her. You have to meet her. <laughs> Um, and it all just kind of built from there. Um, but I guess the last thing, and I know you're ready to move on to the next question. No. It's been very much validated during this trip. Um, so not only, we're make, so we're making, and some of the team is here, and they're doing a great job. They really are. Um, actually, why don't you raise your hands if you're on the AIQ, you know, the AIQ team here? Um, that we're, we're making really fast progress with the, the great work that's being done by this group of people here. Um, but what we also found as we went out and started talking to clinicians in, in Australia is like, the, it's just kind of the right place and right time for what we're doing. In the US market, we're still a little early. Like there's still, there's still the market needs to develop a little bit more before it's really going to be ready for what our technology does. But the market here is, is ahead. And so we like to hear that story. Yeah. We're always surprised, but we like to. No, hear. I mean, in, in this space, it, in, in it, and it's very true. I mean, <laughs> very consistent in terms of the conversations we had. Um, so if you are a company that's trying to, to take chances and experiment and learn, and there's a market that is high quality of care and advanced, then, I mean, it's the perfect place for us to start selling our product and doing that, that learning iteration. Sorry for the long answer. No, 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 it's a great long answer. Never apologize. Um, they're here to hear you, not me. <laughs> so switching back to the science and, and sort of the technology and, and the applications, I'm interested in your thoughts on how you think we're going to use AI in nuclear medicine and oncology um, to transform cancer treatment. What's that going to look like? So, you know, AI is a tool. And you know, somebody today asked me, you know, are you an AI company? And my answer to that is no, we are not. You know, we're a company that is about improving therapy outcomes for, for patients with metastatic cancer. That's what we are. We use AI as a tool. Um, it's a very powerful tool in, in imaging in general and particularly in nuclear medicine because the data that comes out of that kind of a scan is, is so rich, but also so noisy. And that's very ideally suited for a, a computer to be able to process more efficiently and in many cases more accurately than a human. Um, 
But our philosophy is we only employ artificial intelligence when we can't find another way to do it. Um, now, kind of talking then about, well, what are the companies, what are the different ways that, that you can use AI as a tool within imaging, you know, nuclear imaging, imaging, oncology in general? There is, the word I use is there's an ecosystem out there right now. There are all these little companies that are all trying to find different ways to use this really awesome new tool to find, you know, to do things that are being done today better, faster, you know, more accurately. Um, and, you know, some of them overlap. And in the worlds where they're overlapping, you know, then there's going to be winners and there's going to be losers. And, but a lot of them actually don't overlap. A lot of them are, are very much sort of adjacent to each other. Um, I don't think that's what it's going to look like in five years. You know, I do think what's going to happen is you're going to, there's going to be some level of consolidation. There's going to be a need for more interoperability. Um, you can't, you know, hospitals are not going to want to buy, use five or 10 different vendors to get from the beginning of the patient journey to the end of the patient journey. Um, and when you start putting them together, I think there's going to be a, a, a multiplying effect in terms of that, that improving of care, the accuracy piece. Um, I think we're going to see that over the next few years that, you know, there's, there'll be a little bit of weeding out where companies are doing things that other companies were already doing. You know, that'll cart will slim down a little bit. I, I'm sure we're going to start to see some consolidation. Um, I don't really know from our point of view, does that mean we get consolidated or we become a consolidator? Who knows? We'll see over time. Um, but eventually we're going, there's going to be a, a system of these toolkits. You know, we're not replacing it. Right. And I think that's the, the, that's the place where people often, you know, go wrong. It autopilot doesn't replace pilots. But it sure does make pilots' jobs better, safer, more accurate. You know, there's all kinds of stuff that's going to happen with AI that is not going to replace a human being. But I actually do think it's going to really raise the bar on what that human being is capable of doing. So we will change the way people do their jobs. We broadly by employing AI in the care of patients with cancer, um, and hopefully it's it's for the, to the benefit of the patient. Um, so, you know exactly how that all comes together. Um, I think that's where market forces are gonna come in. And you know, the, the clinical world is gonna vote. They're gonna vote by deciding which systems to purchase. Um, so. Interesting, interesting insight. So you don't have any particular strategy then around we've spotted these guys and we think we're gonna, our exit plan is to be, be acquired by an X or a Y. So, you know, if my investor's listening, of course I do. <laughs> um, I really do believe that, you know, fundamentally you have to build a um, solid, profitable, successful business. And if you focus on building a business that delivers value, real value that people will pay for and in healthcare that actually helps patients, um, then there will be an exit path. Um, my first guess on that exit path is that some bigger company is going to buy us and put us into, you know, again, back to that consolidation. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't ruled out the idea that it could turn out that we actually end up starting to buy some of these adjacent companies. And maybe we need to build something. Maybe we do build something that is more comprehensive of an offering ourselves. Um, so it could potentially go that way as well. Um, as a CEO, you know, most of my energy is just thinking about how do I get to my next round of financing? <laughs> so yes, I have to think about how am I eventually going to get money back for my investors? Cause they want me to tell them that they're going to get their money back. Um, but a lot of it is, you know, if we don't do what I promised my investors, we would do in the next 12 to 18 months, then we will no longer exist. And I have 30 people whose jobs depend on us doing that. And so, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit about what happens out three, four, five, 10 years, but mostly it's okay, how do we really focus? And how do we make sure that a year from now, 18 months from now, we have made enough progress that a new group of investors are gonna come in and, and give us their money. 
So do you think that there's, I'm, I'm interested in your insight into the US market being in this particular area, maybe we're a bit more advanced. So what transformation or what is different here, or maybe that's already happened here that you think is going to happen in the States? So, what have we done well? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's two things I think that, well, there's probably a lot of things that, that help that, you know, the what have you done well? Um, some of it is you, you, from my impression, you are a very pragmatic culture. Um, it, it is very refreshing for me how people here seem to be focused on actually getting stuff done. Um, and, you know, we, we didn't need to, we're, we're talking to one potential partner customer that could be just immensely valuable to us. It's based in Australia, but a multinational. And by the second meeting, we were talking to the number two person in the company. And then the next meeting was with the people who could actually make something happen. You know, there wasn't you know, committees and layers and all of that kind of stuff, which just does breed inertia. So, so I think it starts with the, with the people. Um, you know, obviously a, a culture of good science, you know, that, that doesn't come from nowhere. So I'm sure there, there's a lot of reasons that other people know better than me as to why some of the best science in this area comes out of Australia. And I, and, and, and I'm not just saying that when I talk to the leading researchers in the United States about this particular space, it almost always points back to Australia. Um, the structure of your healthcare system is also enabling to innovation versus the structure of the healthcare system in the US. Um, the way that our privatized system has been set up and the bureaucracy that has been, that has metastasized <laughs> in our, our system does create roadblocks to adoption of new technologies. Um, and I can say that beyond just the space I'm in. Um, both of the big multinational companies I worked for, the most innovative products we had were not available in the United States. Hmm. So can I ask you another unscripted question then? When sure. We usually think of the US market here as being sort of the primary market that we're, that we're looking to enter. Do you think maybe we should do that differently? No because economically it is still the still right one. Yeah. big market. You know, China may change that, we'll see. But the Chinese market is a really, really complicated market. Um, I've worked with the Chinese market from when I worked at those big companies, um, but it's another big market. But when you are successful in the US and when you, you know, through all of that effort and, and luck, manage to get an innovation through that, that all those hurdles and make it standard of care, um, it is a very big economic market. Um, and, in, and so it remains an important market. Another really big market, of course, is Europe. But in Europe, it's not really one market. Mm -hmm. Europe is 30 some different markets, 20 some different languages. You know, it, it, we're actually looking at Europe right now. We decided on Australia first and Europe second, um, but it has its own complexities that, that are kind of above and beyond some of the complexities of the US. So yes, I think if you're an entrepreneur trying to start a business in Australia, in med tech, you do want to have your eyes on the US. It's going to be an important market from a business perspective. Um, but I, my, you know, Eric Corlew's opinion is, it's not gonna be the most innovative market. So you, you know, it isn't necessarily gonna be the market that proves the, the clinical value of your product. It's just gonna be the market that you're gonna need if you're ever gonna be big enough to be you know, acquired or, or IPO. Hmm, that's really interesting insight. So you, there's a few people from ARQ in the room today. You met them, I'm assuming. For the first time face to face a couple of days ago. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, some, some of them yesterday. Yeah. Hours ago. So how have you overcome the challenges of establishing an office on the other side of the world when travel has been extraordinarily limited, particularly here in WA? Um yeah. Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> um 
there's no way we could we would have done this if it weren't for the pandemic. I, you know, there's no way we would have gone from initial introductions, vetted people, hired people, found local lawyers who could help us hire people, and then establish a business, and then and then you know all of the things that we've done, establish research collaborations with the university, and all over Zoom with a 13-hour time zone difference. Um, which is in some ways even harder than the Zoom. Mm. Um, so, the, you know, it, I guess the answer is, is it was the only option we had. Um, but it was also very much aided by the fact that our founder had done his sabbatical here. And so we started with a relationship with a couple of people who we deeply trusted. We, my, the entity, not just of me, but AIQ started with a few people who we deeply trusted and we had those that where there was face-to-face -face relationships. Um, those people then were able to vouch for the next people that we talked to. Um, and we did do some independent verification, just, you know, um, but, but a lot of it came down to the fact that we, we started with a core relationship um, that then allowed us to have a little bit of faith and you know, sometimes you do just say, "Well, we're going to hire this person, and you know, we're going to set them up as as the managing director of our com company in another country, and we're going to put money there, and we're going to trust that it's going to work." And you know, yeah, we've had some great conversations on Zoom, but sometimes you do just have to it goes, it goes back to that risk taking. Yeah. At GE, never would have happened. They would have waited. We would have waited out the pandemic. So I'm glad we didn't because we made some really great progress during the pandemic. Um, we have people here who are willing to get on team calls at 10 or 11 p.m., which is really nice. <laughs> um, and we figured out how to make it work. Um, I will say we did, you know, one of the people we hired was conveniently already in the US. And so we did bring her to um, you know, Shasha, who I'm talking about right there. We did, we did bring her to our office for a couple of months, was it? So we trained her okay. and then sent her down here, <laughs> back down here. Um, so, you know, again, it's about how, do you, how can you be creative? Um, but I, and, and I have to give Russ credit for that. Russ found somebody who happened to, to be in the U.S. who wanted to come to Perth. Mm. Excellent. I mean, really, you should be asking Shasha about how it was that she accepted a job when she was in the United States and she'd never been to Perth and she agreed to move to Perth. <laughs> You're interested in sharing? <laughs> so for those online, the answer was she's originally from New Zealand. <laughs> well, welcome to Perth to you too. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. So the, the last question on my list, unless anyone else has got anything, is um, recruiting and retaining talent, keeping on this same theme, is obviously becoming a massive challenge. Not, I mean, we talk about it regularly here and in a, across the country. So how are you working on that other than recruiting New Zealanders who already live in the US? <laughs> um, oh, and it's a huge challenge. And in, in some ways we've been very successful and in some ways we're struggling um, just like everybody else. Um, I am a really big believer that, you know, compensation matters, but really, you know, compensation is necessary to get somebody interested in your company um, you know, but really what retains employees is the team and the culture and the environment. Uh, one of the things that was, was fun for me, uh, normally as a general manager, you come into a business and the culture is broken and you have to fix the culture. And so I've done that a few times. Um, this was the first chance because I was the first employee where we sat down and defined our culture. This is what, this is who we are going to be. These are the kinds of people we want. And once we defined that culture, you know, the founders and I, as we started to build the team, went out and looked for people who fit the culture, but were attracted to the culture. Um, and as a result, we have had extremely low turnover. Um, and I think, of, I, I believe a lot of it is because we've created a culture where, you know, people enjoy what they're doing. They, you know, they, they, they feel rewarded, they feel recognized, you know, we do, we check all the boxes, um, you know, in the United States, for example, healthcare, right, 
We don't have a government healthcare system. We provide really, really good medical insurance because it just, I don't think anybody should have to worry about that. And so that's an investment we make. Um, but really, I, I, a lot of it does come down to what's the person gonna do? One of our five culture pillars, and, and I'm not gonna talk about the culture <laughs> pillars, <laughs> Um, Cause I can do that for like 30 minutes. And everybody. <laughs> um, but one of our five culture pillars is learn. And it goes back. It's kind of like that same thing with the, the taking risks. Um, we need to learn as an organization. And that means every employee in our company has to be constantly learning. So one of the things that I always ask the people when I interview is what do you want to learn? And, you know, how can we help you learn? Um, and we spend a lot of time trying to figure out, okay, you know, this is where that person wants to go. How do we help that person learn and grow in that direction? Um, and again, that, that creates an incentive for both for the, the recruiting and for the for retention. Um, you know, I do think we've been fortunate with the people we've hired here, um, you know, for good or for bad. You know, we've got a phenomenal team here like we do in the US. Um, interestingly, the hardest role we've had to, to hire globally is sales. Um, it, because with scientists, there's, there's, there's only so many medical physicists in the world. Um, and so you get into a network of medical physicists and you find your people and, you know, software, you know, you locate in some places where there's some strong software people. Um, the, the area where it has been hardest for us to find really good people right now is, is in sales. Mm, all right. Well, on that, on that note, how are we doing? Like, we are pretty much bang on time. So I'm going to thank you very much for sharing your insights and your experience. I'm going to, can we all give Erica acknowledgement? Yeah.